Christ crucified because people didn't think he was pure enough. Some people didn't think he practiced his religion of Judaism correctly. The Romans thought he did not practice being a subject of Rome correctly. They killed him for being holy instead of pure. He wasn't the Messiah some of his religious fellows expected. He confounded some sects of his own faith. He insisted the Torah, the religious rules and customs, were tools to point toward holiness. When there was a conflict between purity and holiness, he picked holiness every time. <clears throat> His Roman opponents insisted being subjugated and obeying Rome was the only way to be a good subject of Rome, and to be any type of threat at all to Roman order was not allowed. But each time, Jesus forsook the purity of what the Romans wanted for holiness of saying and doing what he believed to be right. It's because of this valuing of holiness over purity that Unitarian Universalism has no creed or dogma. And yet, even though we have no creed or dogma in Unitarian Universalism, we still have our own struggles with purity. In some congregations, if anyone questions a custom of the congregation, well, that's not being pure. In some congregations, if anyone dare says God, well, that's not being pure. In some congregations, if anyone dare not be a social justice activist, well, that's not being pure. If someone dare vote for a Republican, that's not being pure. Even though we have no creed and dogma, we have our own struggles with purity and holiness. In her latest book, Shameless, Nadia Bowles Weber outlines a great distinction she makes between purity and holiness. And she says, religion too often falls into the trap of demanding purity. You must follow all the religious rules. You must believe all the religious beliefs just like everyone else. You must use all the right words for God. You must not be gay. You must not be feminist. You must cover your head. You must save sex for marriage. If you dare deviate from any of this, you are impure, and not only impure, you are evil. Only the purely righteous can be holy. And to coerce people into purity in all too many parts of our human existence, we shame them. She writes, purity is easier to regulate than holiness. Our purity systems, even those established with the best of intentions, do not make us holy. They only create insiders and outsiders. They are mechanisms for delivering our drug of choice, self-righteousness. And these purity systems affect far more than our relationships to sex or booze. They show up in our religion, in our political ideology, in the way people shame each other on social media, in the way we obsess about eating the right diet. Purity most often leads to pride or despair, not to holiness. Because holiness is about union with, and purity is about separation from. The way she describes holiness is related to how we are looking at wholeness in this month with our theme of wholeness. She says holiness happens in those moments when we are blissfully free from our ego, and yet totally connected to ourself and something else. Holiness is the thing I never saw coming that makes me catch my breath because I know the sacred has interrupted my isolation. Her book is about Christianity and sexuality, but purity versus holiness, well, this division and these distinctions hold up really well in just about any and all other areas of human life. Much conflict that we experience is due to our self-righteous tendencies to demand purity from each other. Things others do that hurt us, the reason we bear a grudge, 
is because somehow the other doesn't live up to the bar of purity we have set for them. If we can get off our high horse of purity and remain on the ground, we can walk toward them and try for holiness and unity, forgiveness, making a way forward, and allow them and all of their imperfectness to be holy. For being holy, as this distinction between holy and purity emphasizes, isn't about being perfect. Being holy isn't even always about doing the right thing. It's about bringing our whole self, our real self, to the relationship, owning our wrongs, accepting ourselves as imperfect, accepting others as imperfect, accepting that all of us are as impure as each other. It's near impossible to see others as holy if we don't see ourselves as holy. It's impossible to see others as lovable if we don't see ourselves as lovable. It's impossible to accept others if we don't accept ourselves. It's impossible to forgive others if we don't forgive ourselves. I had a stark reminder of all of this about two weeks ago. I attended a workshop called Coping Creatively with Cancer at Dana-Farber here in Milford. As most of you might know, but some of you may not, I was treated for prostate cancer from November 2017 to November 2018. And I spent most of that year doing my very best to ignore the fact that I had cancer. The treatment itself made me tired, messed up my bladder and my bowels, and my son was having trouble at college. Things at work were a little rocky if you were here last year, and I just put my head down and kept going. So increasingly, for the last six months, since I've been feeling better, the actual experience of having had cancer and being treated for cancer has been catching up with me emotionally and spiritually. So as part of my own restorative or spiritual practice, I am making intentional efforts to do this part of my recovery from cancer now. So I said, I'm gonna to go to the art workshop. I like drawing and painting and art of all kind. I'm just gonna go. I need to do something. And they used a model of creating art, writing about the art, having others write about your art, taking in all the observations and then writing poetry based on the words of observation that you and others made about your art. It's pretty interesting. And our art that we were to make for this session was a mandala made out of clay. Now, a mandala is a Sanskrit word that means circle with an identifiable center that makes a design to the outer rims of the circle. Traditionally, Buddhist monks will make these with colored sands. Have you ever seen them do this? And immediately upon finishing, they will take brooms and sweep it all away. The first time I ever saw this done in person, I knew this was going to happen. And yet I was physically affected when they started sweeping. I was everything I could do to just stop myself from going, no, don't do that. Intense effort, beauty, and our life, fleeting and passing. Our task in the workshop was to make a mandala for ourselves related to our cancer experience. There were two different colors of clay to work with. One that kind of red sand color, rust color, and the other more pale, almost white color. And I began with the white because it was closest to me on the table. And it was that consistency where it was still working, but it needed water. You know, if you've ever worked with clay, it wasn't at optimal working condition. So I formed a circle and the circle cracked and broke and wouldn't it really hold its circle shape or smoothness. And I almost reached for the water and put my hand in it and started to smooth it out, but I stopped myself. I just let it be. I thought, this is not going to be a perfect circle. It would have cracks and imperfections in it, just like me, just like my life, just like my dealing with cancer. And as I sat there looking at my cracked and broken circle, I thought of Leonard Cohen's song, Anthem. Ring the bells that still can ring 
Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. And here I was, making art with cracks. The cracks in my art helped me see the cracks in my life. But everything was there, part of the whole, cracks and all. And I started through those cracks to see light. I was reminded that I'm lovable and acceptable and worthy of love and acceptance. And in my line of work, I tell this to people all the time. But like most people, I'm not very good at applying it to myself. So I wrote some words about my art and others wrote words about my art. And from all the feedback we got, we were to take words that struck us obser from observing our art and write a poem. So I gathered up these words about my mandala and I wrote this. The passion cardinal's light is a harmony part for the mess of this liminal space. Between the branching cracks, the light gets in a perfect center. Now, wholeness, as I said, is not about perfection. It's about accepting all of ourselves as we are and accepting others in their completeness, cracks and all. There are certainly things about all of us that can be better, from our diet to how we deal with problems to our health to who knows what else. And some of these imperfections require ongoing work, maintenance, and attention. Some of them we can get by with just letting slide. But what's crucial is that we believe something Unitarian Universalist Paula Goldade reminded us of in this month's set of resources on wholeness. Universal salvation is not just for all of us, but for all of me. There is no crevice inside of us that love cannot touch. And I really think that that's the point of the Easter story, that when all hope seemed gone. Something wondrous and miraculous happens that lets the light in the cracks. All the places we are cracked and broken. It's how the light gets in. Happy Easter. <laughs>